I don't for what it's worth. Is it amino acid? Interestingly, right. many of these things have. So it was very beneficial for. My name is Matt Caberlin, and welcome to the OptiSpan podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to the OptiSpan podcast, coming to you live one more time from the 2024 American Aging Association annual meeting. Uh, I'm joined by David Cheska, uh, who uh, got his uh, PhD from the University of New Mexico, and then I guess did a brief postdoctoral stint before spinning out his own company, which is Vertical Longevity Pharmaceuticals. Yep. And uh, so David's going to tell us about what they've been working on. Um, it's some pretty interesting technology to target senescent cells and hopefully improve lifespan and health span. So maybe give us a brief introduction to yourself, to the company, and then we can dive into the science a little bit. Oh, uh, okay. So starting with me, I guess my, my professional career started in the Army, which is probably untypical for most people, but uh, I was a PSYOP specialist. And so... I got to see this um, this really terrible health disparity around the world where the rich would have access to healthcare and and the poor did not and so you can imagine the difference in their lives because of that and so that that really got my blood boiling uh, I wanted to figure out if I could do something about it so I got out came back here found out very fast that it's largely a political issue so I mean I would have to be like A4LI or some some huge organization. So that wouldn't work. So then I got into biotech because I still want to help people. Uh, and then found out that the movers and the shakers have PhDs. So <laughs> I had to go get the PhD. In the so end. where did you do your undergraduate degree at? It was uh, in California State University, San Marcos. Okay. Fantastic program. There. Uh -huh. I can't I can't say enough good things about it. It's, it's amazing. And then how'd you end up at University of New Mexico? You know, I was looking for aging researchers. Uh, I, I honestly applied to 60 different institutions for my PhD. And Mark McCormick, he was at uh, UNM. And so I applied there specifically for him out of everywhere that I applied. <laughs> that's the only place I got in. And wow. <laughs> I don't know if I should say that. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Yeah, so uh, he was just starting at that point, yep. though. So he was still trying to get grants. And so he said, you know, Dave, honestly, I can't can't fund you. I, I'm really glad that you're here, but I can't fund you. So went into the lab of an environmental toxicologist, which is we merged the idea like a uh, tuck finch, like mm -hmm. tuck yeah. finch with uh, environment and aging and largely in wildfires. Yeah. Interesting. And so then your postdoc, you, where'd you go for your postdoc? Same spot. So at the nearing the end of my PhD, I, this, this paper sued at Suda et al. came out, and it was a senolytic vaccine paper. And, and what was the target in that paper? And the target there was GPNMB. It's a glioblastoma-related protein. There have been clinical trials with monoclonal antibodies in it for breast cancer. Those did fail, unfortunately, but um, also called osteoactivin. Mm -hmm. And and so they were they did an RNA sequencing uh, experiment, and then they regressed out this overexpressed marker. It's a surface marker on uh, senescent cells in the endothelium. And so they did a massive amount of work. Uh, I read the paper. I said, we have a preeminent virus-like particle expert here at UNM, which is like a vaccine. Uh, can we repurpose it? And my boss said, fine, go for it. And and that that was that was the beginnings of this company, really. <laughs> so so let me understand. So in the Suda et al. paper, what was the delivery technology that they used? Yeah, they used, uh, I believe it was a heat-killed virus. I believe it was. But because we didn't even need to worry about that. We were just yeah. doing a virus-like particle. All I needed was the specific sequence. And we did the C-terminus and the N-terminus just to check which one was more effective. But yeah. So you, you're taking a fragment of the protein, yep. expressing it on this virus-like particle. Yep. You then inject it into the animal. That allows the animal's immune system to recognize it, mount a response against that target. And then if all goes well, it will detect that target on senescent cells, the immune system will kill the senescent cells, and you will have a vaccine-based senolytic. Absolutely. And so they, they measured a bunch of different uh, physiological outcomes related to aging, mm -hmm. uh, insulin sensitivity, white adipose tissue, clearance of senescent cells, things like that. So we wanted to see if we could measure uh, different things for patentability, IP protections, but also we wanted to check whether or not the virus-like particle would be better because 
uh, from a cost perspective alone, it's it's much better than its competitors. I mean, one liter of batch culture results in 20,000 human doses. It's massively scalable. Uh, and so we measured cardiopulmonary protection using echocardi echocardiograms and whole body plethysmography. This is in aged mice. Yeah, 18 months old is when we started. Uh, so we, we measured cardiopulmonary protection, solid, absolutely therapeutic benefit. We measured prolapse, too, because it's, it's easy visual uh, to monitor that. That was massively protected. Um, and then we, measured, we monitored hair loss, and there was no hair loss in these animals. It was, hmm. it's, it's absurd. I, <laughs> there is therapeutic benefit in every single organ that we took a look at. Wow. So, <laughs> and did you look at senescent cells? Did, could you see detect clearance of senescent cells? We didn't have to. We uh, because that work was done by Suda. Uh, we didn't. We didn't feel the need to. We did measure antibody response though, based off the C and N terminus, just to make sure that we were appropriately vaccinating. But outside of that, we did believe that the vaccine would work in a similar fashion. We uh, we did not expect it would be so much better. Uh, that was the thing. So much better than what the original Suda vaccine. Yeah. So in what way are you are you confident that it's better lifespan so we did end up doing the lifespan and they showed that female mice did not live longer mm -hmm. we showed in female mice they do so now you have i assume filed for ip on this technology and you've spun the company out mm -hmm. and you're now trying to move forward going directly into phase one clinical trials or do you think you need to do more animal studies first yeah, exactly. So right now I'm trying to build out a board of expert advisors because we need to do good laboratory practice, GLP uh, talk studies. We need to mm. start the current GMP manufacturing process in a scalable fashion so we can have a, a CGMP batch for the GLP talks and then uh, have that scale up to full GMP. Uh, we are going to have to have talks with the FDA as soon as possible. I mean, there's a pre pre IND. Mm -hmm. uh, meeting. Okay. So you need to do this. You need to do the safety studies yeah. first. Exactly. And then, and then you get, do so you need that to get the IND? Just to submit it. Exactly. Okay. So all of our preclinical data up to this point is enticing, but it wasn't done in the same kind of regulatory rigor that needs to right. occur. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So those, that's kind of the first step. How much, how much does that cost? That would be a grand total of $5 million. Just to get to IND. Just to get to IND. Wow. Yeah, the, the GMP on this takes about $3 million because it's not widely done. Uh, most people are looking at other versions of vaccines. And so yeah. to find this. So do you have a feel for why it's not widely done? If it has all of these, you know, um, advantages, yeah. why aren't more people using it? That's a really good question. So uh, there might have been some early fizzles. So when in the investor space, uh, if if there's a huge fervor around a technology and then people start to lose money on it, there's an immediate <laughs> drop. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. So there might have been. So have you run into that skepticism as you've been talking to investors? I have, in fact. Uh, I've, I've They haven't directly said that they were rejecting my proposal because of that, but they said that this is something you're going to have to fight uphill against. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So So let's just Put that aside. The technology. Let's say you can get the everything to work with the technology. You have you get it through IND. No reason to think that there's going to be any talks, given that you've already had it in mice and they're aged mice, and yeah. it's probably probably that should be fine. Then the next step is to do phase one clinical trials in humans, mm -hmm. and I and I think you said that the 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 peptide that you're presenting is conserved between mice and people. It is so in principle you don't have to change the sequence of the the um, target that you're injecting. Um, so you can go right to phase one, and then if all goes well, move through the typical clinical trial Pathway. process. Exactly, yeah. and the there's a little bit of baking in that we can do for the phase one. So we can, it won't be an efficacy trial because phase one's not efficacy, sure. but there are a couple of markers that we can add in just to see, okay, is it worth pursuing phase two? Yeah. So, now you said the mice didn't lose hair. Do you have any mm -hmm. reason to think that it would cause regrowth of hair? Oh, that would be fantastic. I would love to check that. Maybe shave one of the mice during the GLP study. Yeah. I don't, again, I don't, yeah, maybe, I don't know. How much, I mean, I'm sure people have done this. If you take an old mouse, they're going to lose their hair. If you shave them, 
maybe they don't grow back and you could actually have some sort of quantitative regrowth asset. It'd be, it's, I mean, I, I don't know whether that would work based on the senescence model, but it's interesting. I mean, the, the thing here is, you know, if it really is clearing senescent cells, you have a whole bunch of endpoints that you can potentially go after. Yeah. And so what are the endpoints that you're thinking about if you, you know, if you get to the point where you're ready to do a clinical trial, you know, powered for efficacy, mm -hmm. what are the endpoints you're thinking like might be the endpoints you go after? Oh yeah. Right. So, um, after doing the i program, which is, um, you have to interview a ton of people in a rapid succession. So doctors, key opinion leaders, patients, that kind of thing. Uh, I've, I've, come a, I've come away with two main indications that we could target, and it depends the audience. So like um, with aging VCs and angels, they tend to have a higher risk profile. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for a moonshot. And so they're looking for the atherosclerosis route because they believe that it, it, this could be the first true cure for atherosclerosis. Uh, and so they want to see that moonshot have uh, a likelihood of of going, but when you go to people outside of it, the risk profile is is not necessarily as high. So they want to see something that's cash efficient to market. And so a lot of those types of investors are leaning more towards the prolapse. Um, I'm I'm relatively agnostic on which way we go. To be honest with you, I just I I want to see this in the hands of of yeah. people. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I think you know, oftentimes it pays to be pragmatic when you're thinking about how you get the FDA approval. So, mm -hmm. right. How much is it going to cost to do the efficacy clinical trial? How long does the trial take? What endpoint it gives you the best shot on goal for success, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these are all things that, you know, people with far more experience than I have in that world can advise you on. But I think that's, you know, the goal is to get the approval. And then, as you know, at least in principle, it can be prescribed off label. Right as you can gather additional data to show that it works not just for prolapse, but also for atherosclerosis and also for dementia, you know, mm -hmm. and the things we would expect you might be able to see benefits for with a truly effective senolytic or senescent cell immune therapy. So, and it's crazy because these endothelial cells, they're, they're sending the SASP directly into the circulation. So basically every organ that touches blood could have a therapeutic benefit. We could talk right. about chronic kidney disease. Right. I mean, basically, yeah. What about a top? No, I guess because it's an immune form, formulation, it's not going to work as a topical. Because um, I was um, thinking there's another, it might be easier path to approval, but yeah. you, you obviously have to engage the the immune system to do the the clearance. So, right, right. Um, so what would this look like, you know, in terms of if you got approval, how, how often would people need this therapy? And, you know, what, what is that, what would that look like? Or what does it look like in the mice? Yeah. So far we've done a three dose series once every three months. So it, it, it would be a continual boost. And that's to get full immune response exactly yeah. so it ramps up slowly and so you need this uh three dose series which is largely uh safe uh it's increased the safety profile anyway of the vaccine itself and then after that you would still need a yearly booster which again increases safety i know it, it could be viewed as an inconvenience by some but i would really like to have the option of stopping something and then having no more uh, yeah. negative effects. <laughs> so how do you, uh, you know, how do you get around the potential challenge that the aged immune system doesn't respond as well to vaccines? So, you know, the population that you actually want to target is also the population where the therapy is, is less likely to be as at least maximally effective in terms of engaging the aged immune system. Well, there was part of that was the strategy of using 18 month old animals, which was why it was so perfect that we had some, uh, if it works in 65, what would be considered in a human year, 65 years old, roughly, then it will work at a younger age too. So we started at a relatively old time point. I would like to see this where people, as soon as they're at risk for atherosclerosis, so yeah. around 35, yeah. just start taking it. Yeah. It's it's the only thing that could be on the market that's disease modifying. Statins aren't, PCSK9 inhibitors aren't disease modifying. This would be disease modifying. Yeah. What, what about, so what would be, if there were to be side effects, what would be the side effects that you would worry about in an FDA clinical trial? Yeah, that would be... Uh, we would have to definitely take a look at that. We do know where the osteoactivin is located outside of senescent cells. So we would want to take a look at each of those specific niches to make sure that there's nothing going wrong, uh, that this is as safe as possible. Because we don't want to, we, 
one of the things that happened with like FenFen, right? Uh, it was originally seen as safe, and then they have the thousands of cohorts follow on for time. Uh, and it turns out it was actually terrible. So we we don't want to have that happen. We want to make sure that we're doing it right the first time. Yeah, I'm trying to think also, you know, with senescent cells, there isn't a lot so far in like what is the function of senescent cells from a, a positive perspective. Like why do we have senescent cells? The one area that people point to is wound healing. And so you might be worried that if you had an immune mediated clearance of senescent cells that's too active, that that might impair wound healing. Although I, I'm a little bit less concerned about that because we know in the young state, our immune system is pretty effective at clearing senescent cells. So it's not like it happens overnight where the immune system immediately comes in and, and kills the senescent cells. So you probably wouldn't be so worried about defects in, in wound healing. Um, I guess pregnancy would be the other place. We know senescence is important in pregnancy. And Absolutely. so you probably wouldn't want to have women of childbearing age taking a senolytic or immune mediated senescent therapy. But yeah. outside of that, I don't think clearing senescent cells is expected to have a lot of negative impacts. So far as I can tell, the same, yeah. And I would, if I was pregnant, which I can't be, luckily enough. But if I, I could, I wouldn't want to take an investigative drug. Either. Sure. No, I'm thinking <laughs> even down the road, like after you get it approved, like what, oh, what yeah, might, yeah, what, yeah. what might we not be anticipating at, yeah, at this yeah, point? Yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. And then you know the one other area that I think would be interesting for you to maybe think about is: is there an opportunity in companion animals? So pet dogs, pet cats. It's not as large of a market as human medicine, obviously, but um, it's a large market and the path to approval might be faster, right? And so again, if the target is conserved, you know, there may be opportunities to even use exactly the same, the same uh, molecule in dogs and or cats, do clinical trials there, show efficacy for multiple age related age related endpoints in a shorter time frame and you can actually get FDA approval for veterinary use of new drugs so it might be something worth considering that's absolutely right uh, and and my brother he's a veterinary technician so i mean uh, i've seen a lot of the medical side of the th of companion animals too i would if we could help out animals and humans, that w I would feel so good. Like <laughs> yeah. I actually did something. Yeah. Be... <laughs> well, it sounds like you're in it for the right reasons, right? You really want to have an impact and and improve quality of life for for people. So that that's great. Um, so uh, so this has been a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks. for uh, sitting down and chatting, and uh, I'll look forward to uh, to hearing where you're at. Um, maybe next year at the age meeting uh -huh. in Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching this episode of the OptiSpan podcast. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. If you're not yet a subscriber, please hit subscribe. And I'll look forward to seeing you next time on the OptiSpan podcast.